Um, so, uh, before I begin, Otago, would you mind um, unsharing your screen just for this introduction? Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you all very much for coming today to participate in this virtual and physical seminar in our research seminar series. Um, we welcome in particular Janet Stevenson and Sophie Bond from the Centre for Sustainability at the University of Otago, uh, who will be taking everyone through their Deep South Challenge research project today. We've been astounded at the interest in this seminar. Um, we've had an overwhelming number of registrations. We're up to 180 registrations across the Motu. Uh, and the vast majority of these are from local and regional government, uh, which we're really delighted about. Um, and if you've meant, I'm, I may well have scared some people off coming into the Zoom room today by letting people know that it was going to be crowded. Uh, but I also imagine that people will be joining um, in, over the next five or so minutes. Um, and if you have managed to join Zoom today, that's wonderful news. Um, if you have colleagues or um, you know, friends who weren't able to get into the Zoom room, we will be uh, making a video of this seminar available on our YouTube channel and via our social media tomorrow. Um, so stay tuned for that. And for future seminars, we'll be investigating how we might expand our Zoom room capacity. Uh, but there are also other opportunities to keep in touch with Janet and her team. Uh, Janet and, um, and the whole team will be presenting a series of three webinars via the LGNZ online webinar program EQUIP. Um, and you can jump onto the LGNZ website to find out more details about that. Uh, and um, Janet and her team have also produced an astounding array of engagement resources uh, which they will be making available over the coming month and we will be supporting them to do that. Um, so please make sure that you are signed up to our Deep South Challenge newsletter. If you're not, you can do that at our website, deepsouthchallenge.co.nz. Um, and please also uh, link in with us on our social media platforms. That's Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, so a little bit of Zoom housekeeping if you haven't used Zoom before. Please keep, uh, make sure that you keep yourself muted throughout the whole seminar. Uh, during question time, our moderator will ensure that the right person is unmuted at the right time. Uh, Janet and Sophie will present for around 20 minutes each and then we'll have about 15 minutes of question time at the end. In Zoom, there are a few different ways you can ask questions. Um, if you're connected via an individual connection, you can raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon in your chat panel. You can also type in a question in the chat panel and we will ask it for you. And if you're in a physical hub and you can't seem to find the raise your hand function, just wave your hand um, wildly and I will note that from here. Uh, Caroline Crick, could you please sign like this waiver? <laughs> Um, and for now, sorry, I'm going to find Carolyn and you too. For now, I'll pass over to our, our presenters at the University of Otago, and um, thank you very much. Kia ora koutou. Um, I'm Janet Stevenson and this is Sophie Bond sitting next to me. Uh, we're at, at the University of Otago and we've both been involved with, with others in this uh, project that we've called the Climate Adaptive Communities Project in the Deep South National, National Science Challenge. And I must say I'm overwhelmed by how many of you are interested in what we've got to say and um, I'm looking forward to sharing just some highlights from our work and as, as uh, Alex said we'll be do, doing a much more in-depth version of that um, for Local Government New Zealand uh, during July. So here's just a, a picture of the, of, of the cast of thousands who've been involved in this. Um, oops, um, a, a bunch of, of people from the University of Otago, Victoria University, um, Manaki Whenua and GNS Science and some wonderful students who we've had working with us as well over that last year and a half. 
Um, I guess a bit of the context of this is, is as local authorities, you will have all seen these, uh, these national guidance documents coming out over the last couple of years, and they're giving some really excellent advice for local authorities about how to start grappling with this issue of adaptation um, and the kind of approaches that, that might be useful. Um, and in particular, um, recommending an approach called dynamic adaptive pathways planning. And we'll be touching a little bit on that today. But what we were particularly interested in for our research was not so much what's a good technique to, to, to essentially plan for the future when there are so many uncertainties, but what's happening on the ground right now um, with councils um, in how they're thinking about engaging with communities on adaptation, how EWI and communities on their own side are thinking about adaptation and starting to take action and also particularly what might be needed to minimise the impacts of those more susceptible to harm. So that's been the focus of our research. Um, and we did some in-depth work in Dunedin, Lower Hutt and in Canterbury in areas that were particularly susceptible to particularly sea level rise and flooding, but also we did a national survey of councils and, and many of you may well have been involved in, in that telephone survey um, last year. So what we're doing is drawing very much from, from that work and particularly the national survey. Um, what we'll cover, um, I'm going to talk a bit about why councils are saying they're hesitant to engage with communities, so kind of reflecting back to you what you all said, um, why you're nervous about this, um, how communities are, are already responding to climate impacts, um, so what, what initiatives are, are occurring at the community side, and then Sophie's going to talk about a community development approach to adaptation. And then between the two of us, we've got a little short video, which I hope you'll enjoy. So this quote here really captures uh, the, 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 the kinds of things that many council officers were saying to us when we undertook this nationwide survey of councils about, we were asking them about, are you engaging with your communities about adaptation? And, and if not, you know, why, why are you hesitant about it? And many of them were saying, well, we know we've got to do it, but we haven't even got there yet. We're, we're really um, aware that we, it's important, but, but we don't know where to start. And there were many reasons why uh, they were saying they were not sure about starting. And, and so I'm going to run through some of those. One, one of them is, is an uncertainty about actually what council's role is or will be in the adaptation area, and particularly the lack of clarity about central versus local government roles. Um, regardless of what happens, and obviously there's some legislation in chain at the moment, but councils will obviously continue to have an important role in adaptation, um, and they can also build on their existing responsibilities, for example, for hazards, natural hazards, and also their, their um, civil defence responsibilities. So councils already have, uh, I guess, a body of interest and, and involvement in forms of adaptation already. But importantly, engagement with communities can help identify what issues might need to be addressed locally versus what might, might need to be addressed nationally. And, and drawing those issues out of communities through engagement is a good way of helping councils think about what roles they might need to undertake in the future. There also can be uh, internal confusion about who's supposed to be doing what within councils. And most councils have, have a range of different departments who have different responsibilities for example, for, for roading, for infrastructure, for, for forward planning, um, for communications and so on. And, and they're not sure who should be leading. Um, and in fact, sometimes they're talking slightly across purposes with each other. So we recommend um, the formation of cross-cutting units um, that bring together staff from all relevant departments. And this is something that we are aware some councils are already doing, creating little, little teams um, within councils that, that actually create those conversations between staff. Um, importantly, so that when they engage with communities, there aren't actually different stories happening um, and communities getting confused about that. So a collective understanding of the implications and, and also this avoiding the mixed messages. Another reason why councils are, are really quite nervous is, is, is this question about how do you engage when everything's uncertain? You don't know the scale of impacts, you don't know the timing of impacts, and you don't know what the solutions might be. Um, and this is quite new space for councils. They're quite accustomed to going out and saying, you know, we're going to fix this infrastructure or build a road or, or change the zoning, but, but but this is a very, very new space. And so 
I don't think that's an excuse not to do it. And in fact, we're, we're, we're saying that engaging under uncertainty is actually an essential new skill. We're all going to have to learn how to do that. Um, and in fact, being honest about uncertainty is a way to engender trust. If you go and pretend that, that you know that the sea is going to rise one metre within 50 years, then um, it doesn't, then that's actually not going to be a very good trust building exercise. Um, and also councils need to understand the scope of uncertainty as well. So if you, if you are engaging with the community and you could say, well, it could do this or it could do this, uh, we don't know, but we have to work within the, those parameters, then communities start to realise that, in fact, uncertainty is going to be part of their lives as well. Um, councils also are used to going into a situation with some solutions. And um, if they don't know what the options are, they're nervous to engage without appearing to have the answers. Um, as social scientists, we know uh, from a lot of other research, not just ours, that, that coming to the table with predetermined solutions isn't always helpful if you want to engage communities. Um, community members have a lot of knowledge and experience in the first place that, that can help with developing solutions and involving them in co-developing solutions can both create more creative solutions, but also create solutions that they're more likely to feel really comfortable with. And so going in with, with, with fixed options is probably not as good as going in with, well, here's a range of possibilities. Can you help us design what this might look like? There's also a fear of pushback from the public and there, there are a number of, 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 of kind of stories. There's this legacy of, of, of places where there have been attempts to, to zone an area or define an area as being a hazard area. And um, it's created uh, because there's been litigation in some instances. There's a lot of fear by councils that, that they might be facing litigation in the future if they try and bring in some kind of, of restriction on, on building or zoning. Um, we suggest that, that early and ongoing engagement actually is a really important part of this, regardless of whether you're going to put, put um, planning lines on, on, uh, lines on your planning maps or not. Um, and if communities have been involved in developing those solutions, they're less likely to push back. This is not a guarantee that there won't be litigation. There always could be. But, but the fact is that this engagement is a way, the, the one way that you're much less likely to have to face that. Councils are also concerned about resourcing costs and understandably, it is going to cost to engage, it's going to cost to respond to climate change, it's going to cost to develop solutions. Um, and the, the costs are inescapable and these not, are not going to just be financial costs. For your communities, these are going to be really considerable social costs and economic costs for them. Um, and we need to recognise that everybody is going to actually be impacted in some way and councils are just one of the many players who will be. Um, we argue that supportive action from an early stage can assist communities to become more resilient and reducing the cost of impacts in the long term. And finally, councils are unsure about how to engage and that's really what a lot of this presentation is going to be about. Um, staff are accustomed to consulting on annual plans, district plans and so forth. But adaptation is, is much more complex um, and it's not about something as practical as those. It's much more about developing solutions that support social well-being. Um, and councils are often accustomed to using quite a narrow range of engagement methods, the, the public meeting, the hearings, the submissions. Um, but those aren't necessarily going to be particularly useful when you're wanting to engage on something as complex and long running as, as the adaptation response. And so Sophie's going to talk in a little while about a community development approach to adaptation that we've developed um, through this, this research drawing on, on previous research as well. But first of all, I want to talk a little bit about community responses because, because one of the things we asked councils when we did, when we did the survey was, are you aware of community groups that are working on adaptation within your own areas? And most often they would say, oh, no, no, um, nobody, you know, we, it's our job to inform the community. They don't really know anything. Um, but when, when we started looking, actually, there's, there's a lot happening out there. And, and some of it's pushback um, and some of it's um, litigious um, and some of it's we want to see wall. Um, and, and I mean, this is this is this example is Kapiti Coast, which kind of is, is the is the kind of the, the example that people always roll out about why councils are negative about, about um, engaging. 
Um, in this instance, actually, even though it's seen as a failure, in fact, the, the High Court ended up supporting the council's position um, and um, ultimately that, that um, went through. Um, I guess the, the issue that slightly ironically after that is that although the, 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 um, the people who were trying to push back on this were saying their properties would be devalued and, and they would have to be, pay more insurance and they were concerned about those things. Actually, ironically, as of 2017, about, about a third of the houses within that zone had actually changed hands. And, and that in itself raises some issues about, well, ultimately, who's going to be bearing these costs in the long run uh, when they roll out. So there is, there is obviously, um, amongst the, the, the wider community, there will pe be people who are really concerned and anxious and will use um, litigation as a way of, of expressing that. But there are other ways that people are also expressing their response to these, these crises. And one is groups who are out there already purposefully building resilience. Um, and transition towns uh, throughout New Zealand, including at, at Kapiti, um, are often working on adaptation responses and building local resilience. Um, just not far from here, um, in the Blueskin area, there's a Climate Safe House project which has been going on um, for some time and, it, and the idea here is how can we build um, dwellings for people that are able to be um, effective during times of, of impact from climate change but also can ultimately be shifted away and moved to somewhere else. Um, there are groups like Seniors Climate Action. Um, we did um, a, a student of ours did a lovely project um, looking, uh, working with com the Common Unity Project in in, in Noah Hutt, um, who are doing lots of actions to build community resilience there um, for, for a future which may well be very different from the, the current um, world that we expect in low lying areas of New Zealand. So lots of positive stuff there, and and I I'd encourage you to go out and tap into groups like this to see what they're doing and, and, and offer support. Iwi are also doing some really exciting stuff in this space and um, Naitahu is, is an example that we're using here, but developing a strategic approach. And here Naitahu are not just looking at adaptation, but looking at both mitigation and adaptation within the one bundle of activities and aspirations. And so they're really interested and involved in risk assessment, risk assessment and proofing. Um, and looking across a climate response for both the Runanga and also the Naitahu business community. And as they say, amidst change and loss, there is also hope and opportunities to thrive. So they're looking for those, those positive opportunities in the adaptation journey. But on the other hand, there's also concern and fear. And, and this graphic here, that which we're using in one of the, the, the outputs that we'll be producing from this, just picks up some of the kinds of things that, that, that we hear emerging from communities about. We need a seawall, I'm worried about insurance. My family have been here for generations, what will we do? My property is going to lose its value. I'm concerned about the business. Um, I'm angry the council hasn't done anything yet. I love living here and I'm not going to leave. Who's going to pay? I'm worried about what my kids will inherit. I'm scared my house will fall into the sea. Our carpets are rotting. I can hardly afford the rates as it is. The park's muddy all the time. I'd like to put in a pump, but I can't afford it. And ultimately, who's going to pay? So all of these and many, many more are the kinds of emotions that are created in people when they're facing a future which is really uncertain. What we're interested in is how can councils start to understand that range of impact and that range of emotion and start to work with that in a way that starts to empower communities to respond in a very effective way. And I'm going to just uh, in a moment, I thought my video was next, but it's not. Um, <laughs> sorry, so I'll, go, I'll run through this slide. So, um, so we need to engage deeply um, in, with, with these kinds of issues where, where you've got a community that's likely to suffer impacts at some point in, in the reasonably um, foreseeable future, flooding, sea level rise, erosion or whatever. The community is unprepared. Um, it's more than just a few holiday homes. It's actually a, you know, a, a reasonable population of people. You've got strong attachments to place and, and it may include um, um, people who are more susceptible to harm within that community. And when we're talking about communities, we're not just talking about ratepayers. We're talking about homeowners, renters, businesses, service organisations, iwi, hapu, the schools and clubs, societies within areas exposed to flooding and sea level rise. 
And also the impacts on infrastructure and recreational areas can have much broader implications as well for the wider community. So don't just stop at the boundaries of the affected area, but think more widely into who might be affected, um, who, who engage in this area at some point in their daily lives. So South Dunedin is an example where we've got all of those factors happening. Um, and the this is from the Parliamentary Commissioner's report in 2015. Um, and the purple is, is land elevation of, of less than 50 centimetres. Um, and within there, there's about 2,700 homes and 116 businesses. Um, there have been frequent floods since, well, a number, no, I shouldn't say frequent, that's probably a little bit exaggerated, but there have been a number of floods since 2015, the big 2015 flood, which really started to alert um, council and community to the fact that this area could be really challenged. Um, and here's just some, some images from that. But the important thing to, to recognise is that within that, that area, the, the purple area on the map, there is something like 11 schools, um, a whole number of, of churches, um, health centres, um, a number of rest homes, um, a whole lot of parks and reserves, and the red um, squares there are, are social housing. So a lot of uh, facilities there that are really important to the community and the community's well-being. Interestingly, the community has started thinking about these things, and, 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 and Sophie's going to talk in some depth about what's been happening there, but I just want to show you a video um, about this community and and what the sort of the vibe or the, the sense of, of of purpose in this community is around thinking about its future in a holistic way So this research is looking at ways that community engagement in particular can um, try to uh, build capacity for people to start adapting to the impacts of climate change. It's one of the areas that's going to be significantly affected by changing climate and impacts, particularly from sea level rise. It's really low lying here, it's flat, it was reclaimed land and we've seen those impacts already with significant floods back in 2015. If it rains, you can see the water level changes and it'll slowly sit on the surface and then it'll pour through and it'll come up. And how it will change as sea level rises is a really critical thing to understand. South Lane has traditionally been a very fragmented community because um, people who, who are fighting for every day, they're living, don't have time to reach out and connect to others. So our job in the network and all the groups who work here is to enable those people to have voices. It is vulnerable. For any vulnerability there's also strength there. It's actually helping people find the solutions for themselves. We've had now five community pui and started off with 30 odd people, got up to over 100 this last one, where people can come and talk to each other, get to know each other, and listen to the DCC and give a voice to the DCC about things that are happening in the city. Because it's that capacity to have a voice with the decision makers that's critical to our our survival actually as a community. Connected communities can cope better, they're more resilient and building relationships with those communities becomes much much easier for local government if they're trying to implement change when they can tap into communities who are already ready to start thinking about things and, 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 and work with people on those kinds of issues. So it's about building networks, it's about working with organisations who are already in place who know some of those groups who might be harder to reach, who, who often struggle to engage, um, those who might be struggling on an everyday basis and don't have the space or energy to even think about future impacts that might still seem quite remote or they might not know that much about. So trying to build up those kinds of connections enables that building of resilience and the capacity to engage further in the future. You might be, you might be washing your car in the driveway, right? And um, some of the, the muck that comes off the car in South Dunedin, a lot of them go into the Otago Harbour. Oh yeah. People who are poor have learned how to survive pretty awful things and if they're still breathing there's resilience 
older people have been through heaps and they're still breathing, there's resilience. And so our job is to, is to evoke that resilience and that cohesiveness to make South Dunedin a community that, that can be consulted effectively uh, in terms of climate change and water levels and all of those things that are going to affect us all. I am optimistic about the, um, the future of South Dunedin, absolutely. We've got um, stuff like this happening, which is grassroots, community initiated, and got a council that's working really closely with building those relationships um, and working to try and establish connections across the whole diverse nature of the communities that live here. Um, and we've got some really, really key kind of, I suppose you could call them community champions, but they're, they wouldn't call themselves that because they're very humble, but they just, they love this place and they love the work that they're doing and they're really passionate and, and about enabling people to live where they want to live, to live safely, to live well, um, and to deal with the impacts that, that this place is presenting to them at the moment as well. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about this idea of um, community development for adaptation. And I guess the video gives you a bit of a taste of um, the diverse communities that are in South Dunedin, but also the strengths of those communities as well. And so it's really about working with those strengths. And, and we've kind of um, come up with this not only through our work in South Dunedin, but also through our work in the Hutt Valley as well. And this is about thinking about the value of community development as a set of disciplines that work in communities all the time, but actually bringing that into planning adaptation work, I think is really important here. Um, and so here, what we're, what we're talking about is community engagement understood quite differently from the way that participatory planning might be understood. And so we're trying to sort of draw out that distinction. So I'll talk a little bit about that first before coming back to some stories from South Dunedin. And so here we're thinking about South Dunedin um, as a way in which um, it's, the community is at the centre. So we're talking about the community's well-being, its ability to do more than just cope. Those things come first. Um, and in this sense, um, sort of engagement is kind of founded in community development. And so adaptation work becomes community development work. And Janet's already pointed to the idea that this is, um, uh, that community, that, that climate change is a bit different. And so we need to be thinking about it in the sense that climate change poses different kinds of problems. And so to think about that um, from a community perspective, we need to keep in mind that um, people already have lots of concerns and commitments. And Eleanor in the video just talked about how people are struggling just to get by on a day-to-day -day basis. They may not have time, they may not have the energy, they may not even, it may not be on their ra radar at all until perhaps they get wet. Um, associated with that, there's a whole bunch of health impacts, and I think we, this is an area that we need to do a bit more work in um, as well, and there are people doing that kind of work at the moment, but thinking about the specific health impacts associated with poor housing, that then is more prone to dampness, either from a rising um, groundwater level or um, um, flood events and that sort of thing, and then alongside that, the mental health and stress that goes with it as well. Um, and Janet also talked about the sort of emotional connection there as well. And I think this is really crucial for thinking about how we work with communities in these kinds of places because um, this is their home, this is their place, this is the place that they're connected to. We all sort of associate with places and, and, and our identity is embedded in places as well. So it becomes a really emotional and hard thing to start thinking about um, the kind of significance of the change that we're talking about here as well. Um, and another crucial um, uh, kind of factor is the kind of justice side of things or that things are fair. I mean, for pe people living in South Dunedin and communities like South Dunedin, they're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it is not, you know, we need to kind of move away from, well, you know, you should just move because some people can't just move. And so people are differentially affected by the impacts of climate change. And it's very easy to forget that um, not everyone has the, um, the resources available to them to be able to just sell up and move somewhere else where, um, where flooding might not be such a big issue. And so we need to think that these impacts are actually unevenly distributed and that people's ability to cope in those spaces um, are also variable depending on their own resources and their own situation, who they need to look after in their lives um, and all of those sorts of things come into play as well. So even all of those people in South Indian have varying different abilities to cope. Um, so we need to keep those things in mind as well. And we also are often um, sort of targeted towards just thinking about ratepayers, but we need to think about communities and those affected um, as much further beyond just ratepayers, people who rent, uh, the youth, the elderly, people who use those services, um, and infrastructure within a particular place as well. So those are the kinds of things that we're trying to kind of draw into starting to think about community engagement here. 
Um, and so I guess um, the 2015, coming back to Dunedin for a moment, Janet mentioned that those 2015 floods were, were a key moment. And I think there's, a, there's been a really, really significant shift in both what's happening within the South Dunedin community, but also what's happening within the council since those floods in 2015. And so a lot of our interviewees from local government and other agencies working in this space talked about the floods in 2015 as this catalyst, as an eye-opening event, um, uh, representing what might be in the future, um, making climate change real. Um, and interestingly, that last quote, they're opening up conversations that wouldn't have occurred otherwise. I think that's absolutely crucial. But, but the thing is, we don't want to have these trigger events to get us to start thinking about these things. We want to be thinking about them um, more proactively than that as well. So we start here from first principles, and it's about fairness and justice. Um, so it's about making things better than they are, um, or at least trying to, using the changes that are facing us as an opportunity to try and make things better and address some of those inequalities that might be in places um, as well. But it's quite hard to do that if um, we think about communities as something we don't really understand. So this quote kind of captures that, and I think the barriers that Janet talked about earlier kind of encapsulate that sense of communities are out there um, and we don't really know them very well. Um, and so actually it's about getting to know them, it's about starting to understand where they're coming from, starting to understand what their passions are, what their visions are for the future, what their concerns are, what they're scared about, all of those things. And if we can do that, then we can build trust. And that trust and that understanding and that knowledge goes both ways. So it goes from councils trusting communities to have the knowledge and have the experience and knowing their places, but it's also about communities trusting council to engage and make decisions that is fair for those people who are there as well. So really this is about building relationships and this is where we kind of draw out that distinction between the kind of participatory planning that is for a particular, maybe for a statutory plan or a particular project that has an end date and an end output into thinking about this as an ongoing set of um, skills that we need to develop for relationship building. And so we sort of draw out this distinction between the idea of public participation as episodic relationships between council and society, or local government and, and civil society, as opposed to this sort of long-term engagement around relationships that are active and ongoing over time. So many of you will be familiar with this diagram here. Those of you who aren't, this is kind of the, the, the kind of classic map from an adaptive pathways map. And that, the, um, the adaptive pathways um, approach is one that's been recommended in the MNC guidance for local government to use and it's been quite popular and, and has been shown to be working. And basically what it is, is it is a way of developing a series of different pathways for planning and uncertainty that um, when, a particular, when a particular pathway meets a trigger point or a signal, then we shift to another pathway that's um, developed for another kind of climate change scenario. So it's kind of like a tube map, if you like, and you take a different route depending on what um, what signals and triggers are present in the particular environment. So within this framework, there's been a really, um, and the MFE guidance um, does produce some really nice work around um, uh, participation for these kinds of planning projects, um, developing these kinds of plans. Um, and I highly recommend anyone who hasn't had a good look at it to actually kind of dig into that. But what is kind of significant about developing these kinds of things is it still engages in, in participation perhaps in a more episodic way. At key moments, developing the different scenarios, the action A, B, C, et cetera, developing the signals and triggers that are going to be relevant for particular pathways might be another particular sort of participatory moment, if you like. Changing pathways might be another one. So this is really important and this, require, this, is, this could be, you know, could promote quite hard conversations to be had. Um, so participation in this context is crucial. And, but for some communities, getting to have these, these conversations about developing pathways actually requires a whole lot of work to be done beforehand. So some communities might be ready to start this now, but a lot of communities, um, including the ones we've been working in, probably need a whole lot of stuff to happen before we even get to the point of having those conversations. And so what we're suggesting then is that this sort of community engagement actually rumbles along underneath and starts way before and continues all the way through. And this idea is around creating these ongoing relationships that create readiness for engagement and adaptation planning that make the participatory moments more effective. Um, it's about building trust, it's about respect and support, it's about creating safe spaces for those really hard conversations to have and um, the emotional side of this to be expressed as well. 
Um, so it's about building capacity to engage. Um, and um, so what we're saying here is that this episodic participation for these discrete moments is absolutely crucial. We need to have those as well for the, for the planning, um, the adaptive planning um, programs that are going to be happening. We have to have these participatory processes. And, and, and as I said, the MFE guidance is really good there. But we also have to have this ongoing engagement that's constant and building trust and relationship building. And, and this is about that kind of um, allowing those spaces for the emotion. The defensiveness, the moving through the defensiveness and the anger into that, okay, so what can I do about this stage, which takes time and will be different for different people in different situations, and creating that readiness um, for actually engaging in those episodic participatory moments, um, building on care and empathy and respect and those kinds of things as well that we think about when we think about effective relationships. So I want to move now um, to a couple of stories from South Dunedin that, um, that, that have kind of come through our work. Um, and from, this is really sort of since uh, 2015, since that kind of catalyst moment, I think we could call it. And um, post-2015, I think it's fair to say um, that the reaction from council and many people that we've spoken to from council have acknowledged this as well and talked about it quite clearly, that the immediate post-2015 floods was quite a defensive reaction. It was quite kind of removed from what was really going on. And there were some comments in the paper from the mayor um, that talked almost immediately around managed retreat. Um, and it was done in good faith. It was trying to bring forward the conversation around climate change. But it, it, it was read from people in the community as a kind of abandonment and um, sense of um, fear um, and escalating fear. And the response from the community at the time immediately after the floods was, um, was anger and um, a, a sort of a, an argument that, that um, the floods were caused by an infrastructure failure or lack of maintenance. Um, and and um, this was sort of part of an ongoing story of neglect for South Dunedin as well. So those were the kinds of things that was coming through at the time immediately after the floods. By mid-2016, um, there was recognition that um, the damage caused by the floods was contributed to by a lack of maintenance um, and that that was being addressed. Um, and in, and, and the, there was a, a formal apology to um, residents and households in South Dunedin from the mayor um, for that event. And in mid-2017, um, some community development officers from within the council initiated a, a plan and plate night to try and bring people together to try and start working forward, moving forward away from the kind of blaming council into a, into a, a kind of different kind of phase that's starting to talk about climate change and talk about the impacts and talk about the future as well of the place. Um, and this also was reflected by a shift within people in the community as well. Um, probably quite uneven, that shift, but um, there was generally a sense that people were starting to draw on the existing, existing strengths and think about the future in a different way. Um, so there were these two parallel processes that started from that kind of moment, two years post-floods, that I think is really positive and um, that um, we've kind of... Um, looked at. So from the community side, two, um, two uh, we, we've called them community champions, but two local people have taken up the, the idea of the hui that started with the, the plan and plate night as a kind of um, biannual event. So um, they've had several now. Uh, and this is about bringing people together from all sort of um, parts of the, the sort of quite diverse sort of and quite large um, South Dunedin area. The first community hui um, in early 2018 was mostly agencies who work within South Dunedin. So um, people like uh, 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 support service agencies and um, there's a whole raft of different agencies that all came together. Um, there were, I think, 40 or 50 people there that night. Um, and there were very few residents though. So that was something that the organizers were really trying to encourage to try and get those agencies to go out to their people to tell those people to come in. And that started to work because at the next two there were more people and so on. And the most recent one, um, there were about 130, 140 people there, including many residents as well. Um, council officers are invited to come and speak at the HUI, but they're not central. Um, it's about creating a space in which they can ask questions uh, at the HUI, they can, um, they can ask questions of local people, but local people can also ask questions of them. It's about information sharing um, and that sort of thing. And it's about creating that space for connection, conversation, and for developing visions for the future as well. Um, 
And, and most importantly, these who are actually about creating voice, enabling um, local people and residents to have a voice within these processes um, or to um, gain a voice over time to work towards that if they don't feel like they've got one at the moment. And the other sort of development within the space is that now um, the people who organised um, the hui had formed a ropu or a, um, a, a sort of a committee, if you like, um, the community, South Dunedin Community Network, um, have a steering group that they, and they've sought funding for a community facilitator who works half time. So now they've got someone on the ground actually doing that work as well, um, as liaising with council and the, uh, community, uh, the, the, the uh, community development people in council um, as well. So that's all really important stuff. And just to give you a sense of um, where this is heading, uh, and, and what's been happening, there's this brief little story here. Um, at the Hui, each time uh, there's a supper provided, and um, this is provided by, cooked by locals who, uh, uh, work, who do a, a, a sort of shared lunch. Um, their residents within South Dunedin, they, they um, go to the support agency, they, they cook a shared lunch once a week. So they were invited to come and do the supper for the Hui. In the first one, they just cooked the food stayed in the kitchen and then disappeared afterwards. At the second hui, they came out and stood around the edges of the meeting um, after they'd done the food and served the food. At the third hui, they sat at a table, participated in the hui, went into the kitchen, did the food, came back and sat at the table and participated in the hui as well. So this is just an example of how people are becoming more comfortable in these spaces over time. And then I just wanted to highlight the sort of council shift that's happened as well. So I mentioned that defensiveness that started immediately post-2015 um, to now we've got um, uh, at the HUI, using the HUI as a forum as well, we've got uh, council officers fronting meetings uh, saying things like, and this is a quote from an officer who was at one of the HUI recently, saying, we don't know what we're doing yet, but we're just starting to have conversations. So again, it's working with and being comfortable with that uncertainty but building trust through acknowledging that we're in this place too. And that's absolutely crucial to this kind of approach. And also the statements like, we desperately don't want to reinforce privilege. So that awareness of fairness and justice right from the start as well, and being hopeful about the future, um, making things better than they are. So just to sum up, um, we've kind of got these kind of four general principles around um, thinking holistically, thinking about the nature of the communities that we're working with, being committed to that building relationships over the long term, that this is different from just normal planning participation type work, that we need to think differently in that space. It's about building strong community voice. It's about recognizing the differential needs of different communities in different places and different people and groups within those communities as well. And it's about recognizing wider community aspirations and the strengths that already exist within those communities. It's about being inclusive. It's about bringing in as many different groups as possible or going out to them, um, which is the approach that the council here is starting to take is reaching out into different agencies, going to those spaces, um, reaching out specifically to people who struggle or are harder to reach or don't tend to engage very often. It's about recognising the unevenness of impacts, particularly for those who struggle to engage. Um, and it's about um, going out to people, as I just said. It's about being supportive, developing those connections within community and between community and council, um, making sure information is accessible, that it's accessible, that it's pitched at the right level for the people that we're communicating with and talking to. Um, and it's about building readiness and collective understanding for getting to the point of having those harder conversations as well. Um, and and recognising the knowledge that communities have and sharing that knowledge um, and doing that by engaging in a variety of different ways. And then it's also about delivery focus and delivery doesn't have to be an input, output right at the end in the traditional sense of a plan or something, although that's important as well. It can be about actually building the relationships, building trust, that is a delivery, that is an output, that is an outcome that we want. Um, keeping community updated, maintaining that constant contact um, and relationship building, and then finding ways to deliver on agreed solutions. And this is a real, um, this is another space for future research um, in terms of the way that the structures that we work with, the legislative structures, the governance structures may make that difficult or may provide opportunities where that delivery is interrupted. So that's something that we need to think about and find ways of trying to create a certainty so that the outcomes or the agreed solutions that agreed that are agreed collectively with communities can be, um, can be met. 
And that's where we're at at the moment. So we will pass back to Alex to facilitate questions. Thank you. Thank you, Janet and um, Sophie. That was wonderful. Um, just a little note that uh, many of us couldn't, uh, the video didn't stream very well through Zoom, but uh, to let everybody know, we will be uh, making that video plus others, plus other resources available on uh, this team's project page on our website, which is currently featured as one of the featured projects on the website's homepage, so you'll um, find it fairly easily. Um, we have a question from Chris Cameron. I'm just unmuting you now, Chris. But just before I do that, just to let, um, remind everyone to ask a question, you can raise your hand in the Zoom chat panel, or you can just um, chat me a question and I'll ask it for you. Chris, we can hear you. You can hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Look, um, hey, thanks, Janet and Sophie. Look, I just wanted to um, get an idea of your thoughts on the appropriate scale of engagement. You're talking about, um, or have chosen perhaps, a local scale on the basis of the suburb of South Dunedin. I'm just interested in um, looking at that versus the idea of a citywide engagement. And given that, um, all Dunedin ratepayers, um, perhaps all Otago citizens, have a stake in South Dunedin um, and in wider Dunedin solutions or implications of what happens to residents in South Dunedin over the longer term. So just interested in your thoughts on how you, um, how you balance that. I guess it's a balancing act in terms of the scale that you're looking at. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Good, good question. And, um, Certainly, as, as you say, the work we've done so far is, has been more focusing on areas that are directly exposed to, to impacts and, and the people who live within those areas. And I guess that, that's one way of kind of defining one kind of impact, but there are much broader impacts that also need to be taken into account. And we, we're very keen to do some future research actually looking at, at what those broader impacts might look like um, and how to start defining those broader networks who might be affected and then how you might engage with those. Because I think, I mean, speaking off the top of my head, I think you would need to engage in a, in a somewhat different way with people who were not the residents and, and businesses of an area, but were people who maybe had kids going to the school there or who used the playing fields for, for rugby in the weekends and that kind of thing. But certainly, ultimately, um, some of the costs of, of these kinds of transitions are going to be borne by the wider community and probably through their rates. Um, and so there, it's, it's both a financial and a day-to-day and -day impact on, on their futures. And so there is a need for them to be engaged. And I just add um, briefly, um, Chris, there's also another um, kind of dimension to it in terms of thinking about, um, I guess, the responsibility for addressing um, climate change as well, which spreads well beyond those who are immediately and directly impacted. Um, perhaps with some exceptions, if you buy in a particularly hazardous place that you're fully aware of. Um, but, but I think it's being aware of that. And I think, um, you know, a step for the future is to start thinking about actually trying to um, encourage people to recognise um, that shared responsibility um, as well. Um, for those who end up being more susceptible to harm or um, impacted more significantly as well. Alex. <laughs> Alex, we can't hear you. Huh. Oh. Just muted, Alex. Just muted. <laughs> Sorry, Alex, you're muted. Sorry, someone muted me. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, we have a question via the Zoom chat from Catherine Murupainga in Northland, and then a question uh, from Paul, which I will go to next. Catherine's question is quite long, but I'm going to summarise it quickly into, um, and I hope I do that well, which is that uh, what kind of systemic or structural changes perhaps um, at a broader level, uh, maybe at a central government level, do we need to see to enable this kind of, um, to properly enable this kind of grassroots community participation or community development approach? <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a question. I mean, I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of looking at the um, 
and, and I think this is starting to happen in different areas, starting to think about the, the planning frameworks and the legislative frameworks that we work within. Um, it's well beyond the scope of the work that we've done, but it's something that, that I think we've had a lot of questions around and people are asking questions about, you know, can our, uh, uh, is, is the legislative framework fit for purpose in terms of climate change and what we're expecting? I think the answer is intuitively no, and we need to start thinking about where that's heading um, and how we can change, you know, a, a, adapt in that sense as well. As far as, um, I think there's a sort of a culture shift or a, a, a thinking th thinking shift that needs to sort of happen around how we think about engagement and, and um, uh, how we can support communities to adapt um, and to change uh, the way that the way that we live more generally. I think that, that that's inevitable um, as well. Um, so I don't think that necessarily answers your question, but there's, um, <laughs> it's the structural things that shape um, the, the variable impact as well that we need to be really keenly aware of. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, that, yeah, with, with the upcoming changes in legislation around climate change, that the Climate Change Commission um, and its focus on adaptation as well as mitigation, I think will be kind of an important part of that structural shift. Um, but it's not necessarily going to move in the direction that we're talking about today. And so um, if, if people think this is really important, then, then the more voices, the better, who, who are making the case for, for listening to communities and engaging really closely with communities in, in, this, in this, what will ultimately be quite a massive transition for parts of New Zealand. Thank you both. Um, we're going to go to Paul Cottom and then we have a couple more questions from uh, via the Zoom chat and I think that's probably all that we've got time for. Um, but we'll go to Paul now. I'll unmute Paul. Can we hear you, Paul? Can we hear you? No. no. You're unmuted but your video You're must not be your own sound must not be on. Okay, we're going to pause okay, Paul yeah. while he sorts that out and go to another question here from uh, uh, th uh, this question. I, I think it's from a local council. Who should be facilitating these conversations with the community, if not the Deep South Challenge? Thanks, Lisa, from <laughs> the Ministry for the Environment. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <Do we have? laughs> um, I'll start. Uh, I mean, I think that... Um, Obviously, local local government, um, but also agencies who are working in those spaces and have um, already got connections with people who um, may not normally or typically engage um, with local government um, functions, fun um, sort of you know activities. One thing we did um, become really keenly aware of was that a lot of people weren't really that clear on what local government do um, aside from you know collecting rubbish and um, rubbish. and that kind of thing so uh, it's kind of about um, I guess building that knowledge around um, what local government does uh, what communities know what agencies are already working within those spaces as well um, and, and reaching out and, and um, you know drawing on those so those kinds of actors are also key actors within this kind of work as well mm. I mean, the, the question of who, I think, is, is an important one. And, and I think there are, there are with, with adaptation, there are really two scales of, of impact. And one is the scale of, of the immediate event, the flood or, or whatever. Um, and the other is, is the engagement on, on the longer term adaptation. And we already have um, facilities and, and people in place who work with those immediate events. Um, so, so the kind of dis, the civil defence grouping. Um, but I think we need to build on that and, and think more broadly about who engages on that longer term adaptation process. And clearly councils, clearly uh, social service agencies, um, Ministry of Social Development, um, and, and even communities themselves engaging with themselves is, is I think going to be an important part of the story. Thank you both. Uh, we're having some trouble connecting with Paul, so we're going to go to another Zoom chat question from the Wellington Regional Council. Um, did you find that different communities had different understandings of resilience? Um, we didn't ask that question. No, but I think we did implicitly. Um, in the, um, 
not so much, not in the big picture in terms of different understandings of resilience, but certainly in terms of the activities that they were engaging in. So the slide that Janet pulled up about the um, community project in Lower Hutt, um, the Bruce and Resilience Trust in uh, Waikati down here, um, a whole um, bunch of other groups have their own articulations and sets of activities that they draw on to try and build resilience. Some of those might be more directly connected to climate change, others might be more directly connected to um, trying to um, you know, undertaking sort of more community development type work. Um, but they're still about building resilience and, and creating sustainability in the long term and sort of self-determination within communities as well, which I think is really key. So yes, in a sense, there's different sort of, the detail is different in terms of the kinds of resilience activities that groups may get involved in and therefore communities may articulate. So you could expect that to extend in other communities who aren't necessarily in specific kinds of groups. Um, but I think in the big picture, it's really about sort of self-determination, uh, being able to, um, you know, be strong in the face of whatever's going to come at you, I think is really what it's about. Mm, mm. So, I mean, I think certainly in, in South Dunedin, where we've done quite a bit of work, it, it's clear that, that resilience for South Dunedin is not just thinking about, about resilience to, to floods, it's actually thinking about the whole future in a very holistic way. So it might be things like, can we finally get the library built that we've been asking for for 30 years, for example? Those kinds of things, which are a part of actually strengthening that community from, from within, that are, that are also important. Thank you. Uh, this is a question from Anne-Marie at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, who is asking about the relationship of people's or individuals or communities' political beliefs in relation to climate change uh, and their responses to um, adaptation and whether that was identified as a barrier in South Dunedin and what your approach was? Uh, well, I mean, I will say when, when we're not asking people whether they believe in climate change or not. Um, yeah. <laughs> Those questions are not, are not being asked. We, we, our, our work is proceeding, working with communities who are already um, being impacted in some way and uh, or are very likely to be. And so the evidence is, is kind of there already. Um, so the question of, of belief didn't even come into it. Um, and I suspect there is a point in time at which that really fails to, to matter anymore. Mm. Okay, well, luckily we've come to the end of our Zoom chat questions uh, because it's right on one o'clock. So thank you very much, Janet and Sophie, uh, for presenting today. And just to remind everyone that there'll be plenty of opportunities to stay in touch and to delve further into the research. Thank you for joining us in the Zoom room and we will see you next time. <laughs>